Um, right, so the topic that we've been given is transna transnational mitigation and um, environmental justice. And I thought it might be useful to bear in mind when um, Dan and I talk about the two environmental, big environmental actions uh, that have recently concluded, um, what environmental justice means in those contexts um, and what gives effect to justice in these sorts of cases. Um, they, these are undoubtedly very complicated cases, not least because it involves transboundary issues and that I think environmental justice in a transboundary context creates its own complexities as well. And for my, for my part, the, my, own, my own sense of this is, I think justice in this in the context of transboundary litigation can only really be delivered if two basic things uh, requirements exist. One, there must be access to justice for those who are harmed or whose environment is harmed. There has to be a forum for their case, for their complaint to be determined in a just manner. Um, and that is a function of a properly functioning judicial system that, in which the victims have confidence it's a function of judicial processes that can deal with the complexity of the evidence and the complexity of the number of claimants who may have a, a valid claim. Uh, it also should deal with impercunious claimants. What do claimants who cannot pay for legal representation do? Can they still bring cases of this nature? Are there local, is there a local market for lawyers to take on these cases? All those things come into play when you talk about access to justice. The, the, other, the other element is to be able to make all actors involved directly or indirectly in causing or contributing to harm uh, legally accountable. Uh, by that I mean you need to have principles that are fairly developed in any legal system which allows for, for example, joint liability um, or, or joint or several liability. The ability to make a particular actor legally liable. So in some jurisdiction, for example, you may not have recognition of a company as an entity that you could sue. So you need to have mechanisms that allow all actors that are involved in a particular uh, um, uh, action that leads to harm to be legally uh, um, uh, to be made legally liable in that particular jurisdiction. So with these two, you know, you can get somewhere in terms of in terms of justice, in terms of getting your case here heard. In my view, I think the UK is. Uh, brought in the UK against a UK domiciled company by overseas victims who say they have overseas claimants who say they've suffered some type of harm caused by the actions or inactions of the British company operating in that foreign country. Um, yeah, so these cases are not litigated in the country where the harm actually occurs. They're litigated here um, and not in the country where, 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 the, where the company actually operates. Now, <clears throat> These cases use traditional private law principles to pin liability. They don't engage in a rights language. They don't, so the cases are not framed that the human rights of X so and so has been breached or the rights of this person has been breached. They are framed as harm and articulated as loss or damage based on principles of negligence or principles of other, other types of private law principles that you run these cases, cases in. Uh, finally, I'll very briefly touch on um, one of the basic requirements to bring a case here, and that is the claimant must establish jurisdiction over the company's conduct overseas. And by that, you've got a, like an EU reg a regulation that, that stipulates um, that jurisdiction is exercised by an EU country um, if <coughs> that company is domiciled in an EU country. So, and domicile is, is essentially defined as you either have your place of registration there, or where you're formally incorporated, or you could have a principal place of business in, in, in a particular EU country and you can be, you can be sued there as of right, uh, as opposed to pre the EU regulations, which um, meant the court had to determine whether, whether the UK uh, or the country where the company is, is domiciled is the, um, is the appropriate forum, which is a harder test to, 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 uh, um, to fulfill. So that's, that's one. The other aspect is <clears throat> a legal cause of action must exist. So there must be a cause of action that exists both in the UK and in the country where the harm has occurred. It's only then you're, you've got an actionable cause of action. So if this country recognizes negligence and India recognizes negligence, 
then you're okay. But if India doesn't recognize negligence, then you're not okay. Because even though the, the, the cases are brought here, they're actually determined by the law of the country where the harm occurred. So that's the law that is used. So in the cases that Dan and I were talking about, it would be Nigerian law that applies on the Shell case, it is Colombian law that applied in the case against um, BP. So that's it in terms of law. I, if you feel that this is like too legalistic, just tell me and I'll make it, you know, I'll bring to the more useful information. Um, finally, types of remedies you can get for environmental cases. Principally, it's governed by the law of the country where the harm has occurred in terms of types of remedies that you can, that you can obtain. But generally speaking, you get cost of remediation or cost of repair. You can get, um, if there's a diminution in the value of your land as a result of the damage, you can get that. Um, the other one is monetary compensation for loss of income or loss of productivity. And often the, the, the courts kind of weigh this out. They, you know, they can be pleaded in the alternative. I mean, you can ask for various versions. You, know, you can say this or that or, or, or another, depending on what your client really wants. But the court will ultimately look at how reasonable each type of damage is. And in the context of that particular case, will award damages. Of, of, of an appropriate kind. And then there are other ways in which you can also ask for damages, but it depends on what the law of the country where the harm has occurred, what that law says to open up more avenues for different types of, of uh, losses to be <coughs> to be part of the litigation. So back round to the Ascensa case. So this is called the Ascensa Pipeline Group litigation. Essentially, it's a claim brought by 73 Colombian farmers in Antioquia, in a remote part of um, Colombia. Um, which has been subject of the um, civil war for a very long period of time. Uh, they brought it against BPXC, I mean, it, the, the, which then changed its name to Equion Energy. Both companies were UK registered companies. BPXC was a subsidiary of, of the BPPLC. It was registered in the UK. So in this case is different in the sense that we didn't go for the parent company. We didn't go to BPPLC. We just went straight to the company that was operating <coughs> in Colombia, but just happened to be registered here in the UK. So the claimants brought a claim under Colombian law of contract and tort of negligence for environmental damage caused on their farms by the construction of this pipeline called the Ascensa pipeline. And <clears throat> now there were lots of other companies that were involved in this pipeline project, but the, the claimants only brought a suit against BPXC because it was felt that that was the most appropriate defendant out of probably potentially eight other um, companies that could have been, could have participated in some way in the, in the, in the contribution to harm, uh, environmental damage in that case. The normal point in this case was that BPXC was not sued because it physically constructed the pipeline, it didn't. It was sued because it was in charge of the construction process and it directed how the construction works should be carried out and supervised others to do the works. So in short, it had control over what works were to be done to contain and prevent erosion, which was the primary complaint from, um, from the farmers. Um, so just a bit of background in terms of the pipeline itself is 800 kilometers long. The pipeline was built a very long time ago, 1996 to 1997. You could still bring an action here because in Colombia, your limitation for, uh, for cases of this kind is 20 years. It's now reduced to 10 years. Uh, but it was 10 years, 20 years um, when this case was, was um, instituted here, so we could bring an action here. It was built over private farmland, so there's a, it was the pipeline trajectory passes through land that was owned by individual peasant farmers, uh, as they're known, campesinos in, in Colombia. <clears throat> and they all had registered certificates. Now, that's quite novel. Often you get in these cases individuals who, who's, who um, work on the land but not necessarily have title to the land, which creates its own complexity. Uh, and the farmers here were largely subsistence farmers, so they engaged in barter trading, they carried out cattle raising, fishing, um, crop cultivation on their farms, uh, and often didn't engage in selling in a local market, in, in a market, because they simply didn't have a market in that area. It was so remote um, that they used to just create a market as and when it was seasonally necessary. Uh, and often they don't, met, money didn't exchange. They used to pass their bananas for a bit of cheese, give, you know, milk someone's cow um, in exchange for not having to pay vaccination for the cow, that sort of thing. So quantifying what loss ha has been suffered was pretty challenging, quite normal um, ways in which that was approached in this case. 
Um, so the complaint was it was environmental damage their farm. This is one of our um, uh, one of the um, trial claimants. <coughs> sorry, one of the lead claimants, 87 years old, hard of hearing, and this is typical of the group of farmers um, in, in um, who, who brought this case. So. That's the trajectory, what you see there is the trajectory of the pipeline and all those marks, LC50, 8230, they were lead claimants. That means they were individuals whose farms were along the trajectory of the pipeline. And both parties selected 10 lead claimants, but then the court, is, the court agreed with the parties that 10 lead claimants are just too many. We can only try four in the five months available, which is just, you know, if you imagine the, the volume of material. So the trial happened um, 2014 to 5th of March 2015, and the judge was um, a, a, a judge in the Technology and Construction Court, which hears complex um, complex cases, including construction cases, but increasingly are sorts of group litigation cases. And these two other trial trial uh, trial claimants whose farms were along those um, trajectory. Combined costs of both parties is 45 million. So that gives you an, a picture of how expensive this form of litigation is, and this is one of the very rare cases that has gone full trial, um, which normally doesn't happen if cases do tend to settle um, in the build-up to its trial. Uh, but that's, that is a significant issue for claimants trying to bring claims. Right, so the type of damage that's being complained of, um, <clears throat> farmers say, well, there's soil erosion on the pipeline right of way, Soil, you know, sediments were being rushed out into streams, so the streams were all clogged up. They couldn't use their streams, and many of these streams, funnily enough, didn't used to come from outside the farms. They used to emanate in the farms, from the farms itself. So there were tiny springs, which you wouldn't think would serve a farmer very well, but actually it serves him for all his needs and his cattle's needs. Uh, and, that's, and that got completely filled with sediment. Um, swampy areas were caused as a result of waterlogged areas because uh, there was so much sediment that has come away from the right of way. These are undulating farms, so they go up and down very hilly terrain. So you get a big swath of soil coming down, and then it just lands on a, on a low-lying area where you would normally uh, grow crops, and then just stay there. And then when water hits it, and this area where had very heavy, intense rainfall, it just stays and stays and stays and doesn't move. It doesn't, it doesn't drain as a result of that. So large areas of land were simply not being able to use for crop cultivation. And the other thing in this um, particular region was that the um, soil was naturally low, not very fertile, so it had low fertility. So any disturbance of the soil has a very high risk of, of disturbing the balance of the soil structure, and the top soil, which is the part of the soil that's very fertile, uh, gets disturbed. You may not, the, the soil would lose fertility for, for long periods of time, so you've got to be very careful. In pipeline construction, uh, not that I knew much of that but, uh, until I took this case on, you've got to dig out the soil, you've got to put your separate layers of soil separately, and then put them back again in the same sequence into, your, into the, the pit where you've, got, you've laid the pipeline. If you don't do that, then you are at risk of, of disturbing the fertility of the soil structure and the, uh, and the soils itself to, man, to maintain crops, essentially. And it also, um, the more disturbed it is, the more it'll start eroding as well. So it's a, it's a catch-22 situation. So what did... Uh, these are examples of how the erosion on the, on the, on the properties, you can see the bare, bare parts are the bare soil areas. So there was erosion on the right of way, right of way is where the pipeline was laid. Then you've got erosion off the right of way because of its undulating terrain. Then you've got swampy areas like that, and they are pretty significant. You know, some of them go up to about um, one or two hectares in the rainy season. Um, that's a sedimented stream, and that's what the farmers were complaining where cows used to get stuck and couldn't be rescued as a result of that. Uh, and these, the um, mixed soil profile, where your top layer of fertile soil gets buried under the, um, uh, layers of less fertile soil. Um, and the environmental management plan um, identified many of these risks that happened. So it identified that the claimant's farm was in a fragile and in an area of fragile where the environment was fragile. It also identified that the soil there was susceptible to erosion <coughs> to start off with, even before the pipeline was constructed, because of steep slopes, because of very he heavy rainfall. This was some of the heaviest rainfalls <coughs> in the world, and because of the soil type is a type of soil that kind of just drains very quickly. Um, 
It also said that soil erosion was the greatest environmental impact that can be caused by the pipeline construction. So it said, you've got to do something about that when you are mitigate your works. Um, and it recommended certain types of what I call erosion control mechanisms. So what you do to keep that soil in so the soil doesn't come off. And that's where the claimants argue the um, BPXC went wrong. They argue that knowing these risks, these, 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 these particular risks in this area, you did not do enough to put, uh, uh, put erosion, adequate erosion control mechanisms. And what you did put in was not adequate enough for this region and for these conditions. That was essentially the crux of the claim. Uh, <clears throat> topography, uh, the, topography, both parties accepted that topography was a key element of this claim. So how the lie of the land is, is where you would find the locations of damage. Both parties agreed to that. That's an example of one of the trial cases. So if you see, I can't, I'm not quite sure I can show you. So that, can you see that, that line there? That's the trajectory of the pipeline. And that is, like it's super steep. I mean, I went to the property and you literally have to claw your way up to, it's that steep. You can't really see the photo, but it's that steep. So anything that you pile up, which you don't protect, is just gonna tumble down into the streams there. So that's precisely what happened. And the, and the mechanism was really very simple in terms of uh, how the damage was caused. We went through the soil type. Um, so what the claimants experts say is, look, the amount of sediments that you find in these areas can only have been caused because of these big piles of stockpiles that you see during construction period. Because when you strip out vegetation and you put piles of soil on the side, the science says that soil, uh, uh, the soil moves much faster with rainfall in this condition compared to, say, soil that is covered in vegetation and in its original place. So the minute you take out soil and you strip vegetation, it increases the soil erosion rate by you know, exponentially. So that's what the experts say must have happened. I mean, remember, this, was ha this happened 15 years ago, and experts going now are not going to be able to model out exactly what happened. But given the location of the damage, given this, the, the depth of the sediments that are seen and the depth of the soil erosion, the claimants experts say it must have come, it couldn't have come from any other source other than from this sort of stockpile accumulation or bare soil left to the elements for long periods of time. So that's another example of, so what we were alleging, I mean, not to, not to go into too much detail, things like height of stockpile was an issue, how you, pla how you place the soil was an issue, um, all of that should have been factored in when you're looking at erosion control mechanism. And that was a picture in 1998 of that claimant's property. Can you see the trajectory of the pipeline? And you see that it's bare soil along the length and bare soil on either side. And that's what we said was the most contemporaneous evidence at the time of the pipeline construction that showed how the vegetation coverage was there to build a case that the pipeline must have been the dominant cause compared to other causes. So the claim, the defendant's case was, it accepted that damage on the properties um, happened. So it accepted that it's still existing damage on the property. Now that was a huge, that's a huge hurdle to overcome. It's even more difficult if the other side say there's no damage. <coughs> uh, but they say, no, we agree that the damage. But we don't say that the pipeline has caused the damage. And anything that the pipeline has caused uh, is minimal. We say what's, been, what's caused the damage is deforestation because these farmers are cutting down trees, and they do. Um, they are grazing cattle, and cattle, uh, cattle hooves can cause damage. Um, there are pathways that are constructed through these um, narrow pathways through the farms. And there's another pipeline next to this pipeline, and, that, and that's true too. There was a smaller pipeline next to the, the, next to the sensor pipeline. And those are the reasons why the, the sediments have, have, have fallen where they have. And they relied heavily on photo interpretation as they mode. Now, that's great. I mean, we would have loved to have uh, relied on photo interpretation as well, but the type of damage that farmers were complaining of were too, micro, it were, were too much at a micro level, my, uh, 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 level on the farm, and these farms are like 90 hectares at a minimum, yeah, that you couldn't see them on fo aerial photos. So we, we, we had to accept that aerial photo interpretation has its role, but it cannot explain, it cannot show you how the damage has developed. And that's, that's fundamentally the claimant's argument. And I think ultimately both parties had to argue on this point. What is the rate of erosion coming off an exposed right-of-way 
compared to background rates of erosion. You know, this cattle grazing, deforestation, what's the background rate? And there, parties had to, interestingly, rely not just on documents that were disclosed in the context of litigation, but also literature. So there, were, there was literature, um, peer-reviewed literature, that said eight hectares per annum is your background rate. And pipeline construction raises that by more than 14, uh, more than 14 times. And it was these kind of, of, of additional information that we used to build a case on causation, uh, which was which was going to be pretty difficult for the judge because he has to work out, well, what's the material contribution of the pipeline compared to all these other types of, of um, causes. Um, yeah, and that's just a, um, a piece that shows. So you see here, this was knowledge of the defendant. So after construction, so when the right-of-way is exposed, you get 1,000 hectares per annum in terms of soil coming off the right-of-way. That's the original land use, which is eight hectares. So this includes cattle grazing, deforestation, you know, all of that. Then when you put in erosion control measures, it comes down to 100 hectares, but it's still 100 hectares per annum compared to eight hectares. And the whole idea of engineering methods is to bring that down, bring it down, bring it down after you get vegetation coverage to background rates. And we argue most of the damage happened in two or three years post-pipeline construction, and the land never recovered after that because None of, the, none of the farmers knew how to cope with that level of sedimentation. <laughs> so, so that was what the case was about. Um, judgment is still expected, it's been a year now, uh, and I think the judge is agonizing over it, but it, it was a five month trial, so it's not surprising that it's taking the judge quite such a long time to form a view. But it was very complex litigation in terms of both liability and in terms of uh, in terms of causation. I, I concentrate on causation given the environmental aspects, but I'm feel free to ask questions about why BPHC, had, what, you know, what evidence was there that showed that that company had, um, um, had knowledge of certain risks uh, and should be made liable. So thank you very much.